welcome uh, everyone to this afternoon's Grand Round presentation. Um, uh, fantastic to see such a great turnout. Not just the, um, the diabetes team who are coming here straight from their audit half day and should provide a very generous uh, audience for this important subject to uh, people practicing diabetes, um, but for everyone. So uh, I'll introduce Dr. William Alazawi, who's going to tell us all about non-alcoholic fatty liver disease. Grand. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. Um, and, you know, they say you shouldn't alienate your audience, uh, but you say diabetes, I say the future liver nurses. All right? So before you come and join me in my department, let me tell you why this is all about the future. And let me tell you why this isn't just about me meeting the challenge, but really put this, the ball in your court and everybody's court and say this is about you guys meeting your challenge. So the first question is, does liver disease matter? And the simple answer is, well, of course it matters. And it doesn't just matter because I say so. It matters because of this graph. And this graph starts any half-decent talk, this accepted, and also any grant application in liver medicine. Because what it shows is that while all of you in this room have got really good at treating your diseases over the last 40 years, deaths from liver disease have been rising at an extraordinary rate. And the real tragedy of this is that the vast majority of these deaths are occurring in people under the age of 65. And you can lay onto that all the um, years of working life lost, being able to care for family members, um, and uh, all the other metrics that uh, become important later on. So we wanted to know a few years ago just how much liver disease was out there and so we teamed up with the clinical effectiveness group the primary care um, uh, academic unit here at the university and we thought we thought to ask in the three boroughs that really we touch up against here how much liver disease is out there and how much has been worked up and so we looked at um, 700,000 adults registered in about 150 contiguous GP practices. And does anybody want to have a guess as to what proportion of adults have had their liver tests done in a two-year period? And this is just ALT, not ALKFOS or Gamma GT, just ALT or AST. Of course, the risk here is that someone will say a number that's higher than the real number and then I won't, <laughs> my, the impact of the statement will have been lost. But anyway... Has it a guess? One percent. Okay. Really? Just that? Would you be surprised if it were higher? No. Okay. Um, the answer is a staggering thirty percent. So this is you essentially get your liver tests done just for turning up in East London. And I know I'm being recorded and mic'd up for all our GP colleagues, but this is in a specialty that tries to minimise testing and minimise over medicalisation. And what's worrying is that one in six of those blood tests are abnormal. And again, that's just ALT or AST, not gamma GT. But when you look at the independent risk factors for having an abnormal liver test, you can see where this may be headed. It's diabetes, hypertension, and a rising body mass index. But all of you guys see LFTs all the time. Surely a mild abnormality is, well, something or nothing, isn't it? So this is a study of 140,000 adults followed for a median of eight years, admittedly in Korea where there are higher rates of hepatitis B than here, but still. What they have done is they've grouped these people according to their ALT. So you can see here 0 to 20, 20 to 30, 30 to 40, and bear in mind 40 is what we generally consider to be the upper limit of normal, 40 to 50 and more than 50. And what you can see replicated for AST as well is that even within the so-called normal range, the higher your ALT, the higher the risk of mortality, whether you have a family history of liver disease or not. And that is well before we reach this apocryphal twice the upper limit of normal, which, by the way, has no real basis in data. So back to the local primary care data. Nine-tenths of people who had an abnormal liver test didn't have any recorded liver diagnosis in their notes to suggest that this was the reason why they might have abnormal liver function. But you would have thought that some of these patients should have some kind of liver screen to sort of at least assess or risk stratify um, the likelihood of significant liver disease. Well, in 
as generous as we could be, we looked at all the drugs, including statins, for which abnormal liver function could be associated. So around 40% of people were on those drugs, so maybe that was the cause. Excess alcohol consumption was recorded in 10% of those individuals, so maybe that was the cause. Only 20% of people had alcohol consumption recorded within safe limits and had viral testing for hepatitis B and hepatitis C, which we approximated to a liver screen, whereas 20% of the population had no, no viral tests at all. In those individuals who did have a liver diagnosis, the most common liver diagnoses were non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, viral hepatitis, grouping together hepatitis B, C and acute viruses, and alcohol. Blue is the number with a recorded diagnosis of alcoholic liver disease, and red is the extra number in whom high levels of alcohol consumption were recorded, but this wasn't uh, <coughs> registered as a diagnosis. And then those risk factors become even more stark when you look at the independent risk factors for having a diagnosis of fatty liver disease. It's just that the hazard ratios are higher. So again, diabetes, hypertension, and rising BMI category. And you can see here that the hazard ratio for BMI in the obese category is fivefold, and that's adjusted for ethnicity, meaning 27.5 in people of South Asian ethnicity. And you can't escape that link with diabetes. Graham Hitman used to say to me, you're just studying diabetes in the liver. Well, I am. This is exactly what we're looking at. Fatty liver disease is the most common cause of liver disease in patients with diabetes. It affects 75% of the population. The risk of having fatty liver increases by 10 to 20% per millimole per litre increase in plasma glucose. There is a temporal association with these two uh, conditions. And having a diagnosis of fatty liver increases your risk of microvascular and macrovascular complications and increases all-cause mortality twofold. But still, there is no call for routine screening for fatty liver disease in patients with diabetes. What about obesity? Well, obesity is our problem, and it's a particularly East End problem. And you can see that the adult obesity map here from Public Health England, there's a little hot spot here in the East. What really, what really troubles me is the fact that year six obesity, that's 10 and 11 year olds, reaches 30% in the boroughs listed. And they are the top boroughs in England, uh, and they are our patch. Barking, Newham, Waltham Forest, Tower Hamlets and Hackney. So we know that obesity is on the rise, and here you can see the UK amongst a whole load of um, industrialised countries, and we're pretty near the top. If you want to know the causes, and Dr Saxena has seen this picture before, because this is a picture I took when we took the kids to some, you know, one of these farm things where, farms in fact, um, <laughs> where they, uh, you know, they've got, um, yeah, <laughs> you can see I'm quite urban, animals and stuff. Um, anyway, so the kids go around, and this is the menu from the snack bar. Now I don't know if um, the foodies amongst you can see this, but it reads, three nuggets, three nuggets and chips, five nuggets, five nuggets with chips, or chips. <laughs> we took a picnic. But um, the point here is the ready, uh, ready availability of energy dense food. And this is why I think we're seeing the, um, uh, the obesity epidemic in the way it is. And maybe that's a point we can have for discussion later on. Okay, so how common then is fatty liver disease? Well, it depends on how you look for it and in whom you look for it. So apparently what I wasn't allowed to do was to line everybody up on the Whitechapel High Street and just do lots of liver biopsies. Apparently that's not okay. But if you do look in targeted histology series, the range is very broad and it's between 20 to 50 percent. If you depend on ultrasound, the range is around, is similar, 15 to 45 percent. MR is really just a, a research tool at the moment. The key message to take away from this slide, though, is that if you depend on ALT to detect fatty liver disease, you will woefully underestimate the prevalence rates. And that's because the ALT isn't really a very sensitive marker of stuff going on in the liver. Overall, the suck your finger and stick it in the air test is that around 20% of the Western population have got fatty liver disease. And globally, those rates are fairly comparable, although there is variation. So, you know, maybe 30, 35% in the Middle East, 15, 20% in uh, parts of Africa. 
and this is work we did and I'm going to touch on this study again in a few uh, in a few minutes time we combined the healthcare records of 22 million Europeans from four different countries and we looked to see what proportions of those individuals had a recorded diagnosis of fatty liver and what you can see here is a typical sort of trend that you know people will make an awful lot of saying oh look it's going up it's going up but those of you who are looking at the y-axis will see that the prevalence rate at the very top there is around 2%. So that is around a tenth of what we expect to find. Now that means two things. First of all, the patients in whom we are uh, diagnosing fatty liver are only a subset of the people that we expect to have fatty liver. And one wonders whether or not the ones who carry a diagnosis at the moment are somehow skewed. And the second, much simpler point, is that there's a big diagnostic gap. And we think it matters because there is an association with all-cause mortality. If you've got fatty liver compared to not having fatty liver. But that mortality is primarily cardiovascular, and that's over to you guys. And I'm particularly looking at the diabetes team at the back. Because we need to have people who can manage uh, cardiovascular risk. And in fact, it's the people watching this on the video who are the most important. The primary care team who can manage cardiovascular risk. Uh, along with obesity, and probably linked to that, is the increased risk of cancer. But I will touch upon that a bit later on as well. And only number three in the list is liver disease. So the challenge then, for me as a hepatologist, is to identify those individuals for whom having a fatty liver is simply a marker of the metabolic syndrome, not that there's anything simple about that, from those people who are likely to develop significant liver disease. And this is where we start to dig into what fatty liver disease is. It's not a single entity, it is a spectrum that ranges from the presence of excess fat in liver cells, steatosis, through evidence of injury to the liver as a result of that fat. So inflammation, liver cell death and scarring or fibrosis. That's called NASH, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. A subset of those individuals will progress to cirrhosis and once you are cirrhotic you are at risk of decompensation and developing liver cancer in much the same way as any other chronic liver condition. So it's important not to conflate that small subset of, in, subset of individuals who are at risk of significant progression from those who are not. And we can see that graphically. So if you look at individuals who only have fat on a liver biopsy and follow them up for 30 years, they have a mortality rate that is comparable to the background population with similar cardiovascular risk factors. The rapid death occurs in those individuals with NASH. Inflammation, liver cell injury, and scarring on a liver biopsy. So the challenge, clinically, is to identify those individuals on the top line from those on the bottom line. And there's more nuance coming out. So the more scarring you have, the more fibrosis you have, the more likely you are to die over uh, a certain period of time. Now there's obviously going to be an element of lead time bias there, but I think the message is if you find somebody who's got fatty liver disease with NASH and fibrosis, then these are the people we should be focusing on. And we know from either placebo arms of randomized controlled trials or in this case from randomized controlled trials that have had no effect that there is a significant progression rate. So perhaps unsurprisingly 20% of people with cirrhosis over a two-year period will develop a decompensating event or a cancer. <coughs> Patients with three out of four, now we'll come on to the staging a little bit later but this is not cirrhotic but significant fibrosis, 20% of them will progress to cirrhosis in a two-year period. In other words, once you're on that train that's heading towards cirrhosis, it moves at a pace. The cancer issue has become a real problem. This is a very simple study from Newcastle, where they just reported all the patients who'd gone through their liver cancer MDT over a 10-year period. And absolutely, the numbers are going up. But what's really important is that black component of the bar that represents the proportion of patients in whom the background liver disease was fatty liver. So not only has that gone up, but if you then break it down and say, well, what proportion of those individuals had cirrhosis versus non-cirrhotic non NASH, bearing in mind that the current dogma is that we should only survey individuals who are cirrhotic, 
then it's actually quite astounding to find that a quarter of individuals who develop liver cancer develop that cancer in a non-cirrhotic liver. Now this has been replicated in much bigger series in Europe and in the US. It's not quite enough to change our practice, but it does raise the possibility that there are individuals without cirrhosis who we should be surveying for hepatoma. So, one of the problems was lo with looking at these very carefully curated cohorts, small studies followed up over a long period of time, is that they're not real patients. And real patients, as we know, have got imprecise diagnoses. They're not biopsy proven. They may not even know that they've got certain diseases, or they may have multiple comorbidities that may make them unfavorable to very picky researchers. They're also socially and ethnically diverse. And I've already given you a hint that I'm a big fan of electronic healthcare records. I think these data that are curated really well, particularly here in the UK, are, cover a wide proportion of the population. The reason it's important to do this in the NHS is because we do not have co-payments to access primary care. So that's pretty unique, meaning that our coverage is near universal. Individuals register at birth or when they move into an area, and that's really, apart from a very small minority who don't have a GP, it covers most individuals. So primary care physicians here in the UK still act as gatekeepers to secondary care, and the flip side, of course, is because this is collected in the routine course of clinical care, there are questions about both data completeness and data veracity. So what we wanted to know, going back to our European cohorts, we wanted to know, could we determine the risk of incident cirrhosis and liver cancer in patients with a diagnosis of the fatty liver spectrum? So we home down, uh, we were a bit pre more precise about who we included here, so it was 18 million Europeans. Of course, all four countries use a different coding language, and so we had to first of all create a common language and map all of those terms to that common language, but once we'd done that, we then mapped within each um, database, each patient with a diagnosis of NAFLD or NASH, to 100 so-called non-exposed controls from the same practice. Um, Patients were then followed until they developed a liver cancer, developed a diagnosis of cirrhosis. So, as you can imagine, when you've got such large numbers of matching, the uh, populations were pretty well, um, were pretty comparable, apart from, as you might expect, BMI was higher in patients with an Affeldorn Ash, as was the proportion of individuals with obesity, as was the proportion of people with type 2 diabetes. So we identified over a three-year follow-up period, looking at sort of 500,000 person years of follow-up. In patient, overall, 8,000 patients developed cirrhosis and 4,000 patients developed liver cancer. And what you find is that a diagnosis of fatty liver, or NASH, increases that risk of developing cirrhosis by fourfold. And if you break it down into those who have NAFLD alone versus those with NASH, you can see that there's a gradient. I'll come back to scoring systems to risk stratify individuals with NASH, but if you remember the FIB4 score, and we'll, I'll explain that in a, in a moment, when you look at those individuals who had a high risk FIB4 score, this is a non-invasive marker that you can all calculate, you can see that there's a still further gradient showing that the risk can be predicted. And we see a similar pattern with hepatocellular carcinoma. When you put all of that together and you ask what are the independent risk factors for having progressive liver disease, well apart from having a diagnosis of fatty liver or NASH, it's diabetes. So if you've got diabetes and fatty liver, then you are already at risk. So if you're sitting in a clinic and you're seeing an individual with abnormal liver tests and you think they might have NASH, what's going to make you think that they have got NASH compared to simple steatosis? Well, we could think about age, we could think about ethnicity, certainly people of Hispanic ethnicity have got a higher risk. We think individuals of South Asian ethnicity based on our own data. What about diet? Fructose corn syrup? is a bad thing and will be interesting to see what happens now that lots of uh, places are starting to cut down on the use of fructose corn syrup. Coffee is protective and that's an Americano, not a triple choc mocha latte with whipped cream and sprinkles. Um, the microbiome is playing a role but again I think that's very much a research tool. 
Genetics aren't into the clinic any, and I doubt they will be at any time soon. Probably the best test is to take the fingers of one hand and tot up the elements of the metabolic syndrome that the individual has, and the more of those they've got, the more likely they are to have NASH. Because this is the way to diagnose NASH. Now, this is not a liver biopsy that happens at the Royal London. I hasten to add, ours have got a lot less claret about them. Uh, this is a picture I took off Google. But a liver biopsy is a really important test. And there's been a big vogue against liver biopsy in, re in recent years. But actually, I think it's a really important test because it gives you accurate information about staging, grading, the diagnosis, and it excludes concomitant pathology. Sure, it's invasive, it's costly, usually just gives you static information. The reluctance, I think, is the reluctance on the part of physicians to request it that is then projected on our patients. And we can categorise and score the liver biopsy in many ways, but essentially what we're able to do is to stage how much scarring there is in the liver from 0 to 4, 4 being cirrhotic. But the key point here is that the biopsy enables us to determine how advanced the liver disease is. But it is neither feasible nor desirable to biopsy everybody. And therefore we do need non-invasive tests of liver fibrosis. And they take two forms. Blood test based um, alg uh, blood test based tests and others that depend on the physical properties of the liver. So if the biopsy is the gold standard, then other methods of assessment include this thing called the fibro scan, and I'll tell you about that in a moment. CT doesn't really have a significant role. MR elastography and other MR techniques are emerging. They give you lots of pretty pictures like that, but their superiority has yet to be demonstrated convincingly. And there are serum marker tests where there are lots of biomarkers that you can assess, but obviously you have to pay for those. Fibroscan is an important test because essentially what it does is it fires sound waves across the liver and it then measures how quickly those sound waves come back. And if the liver is soft and healthy like a blancmange then those sound waves take a long while to come back whereas if it is hard and knobbly and cirrhotic like this table, uh, I mean this table's not cirrhotic but you understand, uh, then those sound waves travel back really quickly and so you can get a sense as to what's going on. We've come a long way over the last 10 years with transient elastography and the, by and large the vast majority of people who are assessed with transient elastography have accurate readings that are interpretable. You can pay for your 11 secret herbs and spices tests and send off £70 for tests like the ELF test or fibre test or other, ELF is recommended by NICE by the way. But that involves a whole infrastructure, and it's an infrastructure we just don't have, so we don't have access to health, uh, health here. And the reason we don't think that's an imperative is because there are simpler tests to use. And there are tests that you can calculate based on routinely collected clinical parameters, such as the NAFLD fibrosis score, or this is the FIB4 I was talking about earlier. And what I've highlighted there in red are the AST and the platelet count. Because what these are variations or refinements of are what you might read in a general medical textbook. That as liver disease progresses, the platelet count falls and the AST to ALT ratio reverses. But the reason we like these tests is because if you apply these tests to those individuals who we've followed over many, many years, then, and we'll, I'll blow up the NAFLD fibrosis score here, those individuals with a low risk, shown on the blue line, have got a mortality comparable to the background population matched for metabolic risk factors. But the people who run into trouble are those on the green, indeterminate or gold high risk lines. Pretty much what we saw in the population study. Everything's got a caveat, and guess what? In a test that has been developed and validated in cohorts that have got more than 90% Caucasians in, the test works really, really well in people of white ethnicity, but less well by around 10 to 15% in people of South Asian ethnicity. We don't see those differences when we use the fibroscan. So for colleagues in primary care, and we worked very closely again with the clinical effectiveness group and with Lucy Carter, who's a GP um, in uh, Hackney, to produce an algorithm, uh, if you like, a pathway for um, uh, what one might do with abnormal liver function tests or an ultrasound showing a fatty liver. So there are lots of things. Either you can refer directly into hepatology, and we'd be happy to see anybody that you were worried about. Or 
If you wanted to do it yourself, you could look at the drugs, think about the family history, think about alcohol review with the Audit C, which we should all be doing on every patient that comes in through the hospital. Um, think about blood tests for viral hepatitis, autoantibodies, ferritin immunoglobulins, ultrasound scan if it hasn't been done already. <laughs> And if obviously you find anything, then absolutely refer directly to us. But if you think that all of that is negative and the patient has got metabolic risk and there's evidence of fatty liver, then what you can do is use one of those tools, NAFLD fibrosis score, FIB4, and determine those individuals with a low risk of having significant liver disease who can quite safely be managed in primary care with uh, advice about their metabolic risk factors, as opposed to those with indeterminate or high risk uh, scores who should certainly be seen by us to determine the stage of liver disease further. And work on going in my laboratory is trying to refine that even more and we're using single cell techniques. Catherine Waller, an excellent PhD student in my group, has been looking at, um, these are clusters of cells in the peripheral blood, so simple peripheral blood cells, and we're already identifying markers that can distinguish patients from, with healthy, who are healthy patients with mild fatty liver disease, and this is expression levels, so markers that drop altogether in patients with advanced fibrosis. Watch this space, but I think that non-invasive assessment of liver disease is, a, uh, is coming on board much, uh, very rapidly. So, in the second half of the talk, I want to focus on treatment. Now you sort of think, well, hang on a minute, why are you going to spend a whole half on the talk if, the, if that top line is true? but I can string stuff out. No, I'm joking. So, the point now is that there are no drugs licensed for the treatment of NASH. And one of the problems we face in development is it's still not clear to us whether or not we should be addressing steatosis, so the accumulation of fat in the liver in the per first place, inflammation, the effect of the fat on the liver, or the scarring. Moreover, the aims of treatment are really unclear. Do we want to reverse the inflammation? Do we want to reverse the fibrosis? Do we want to stop progression? Is it the complications of the cirrhosis we want to prevent, or do we want to do something about that high cancer risk I was talking about? Now the last thing I want to do, diabetes colleagues notwithstanding, is upset everybody with a complex lecture about biochemistry. But I don't think we can escape the fact that Graham Hitman was right. This is diabetes in the liver because the central tenet of fatty liver disease is insulin resistance. Now there are outliers, you've got lean NASH, you've got other bits and pieces going on as well, but insulin resistance is a feature. So increased glucose activates de novo lipogenesis and that is the key step that leads to steatosis. Now there's also inappropriate gluconeogenesis, impaired glycogen synthesis and impaired suppression of lipolysis in the peripheral fat cells, all of which leads to increased delivery of fat to the liver cell. But there is also the counterpart to this, which becomes important when we're thinking about treatments. And that is this concept of metabolic inflammation. Now you will all have heard of it, but for those that haven't, it is the idea that if you have metabolic syndrome, it is not simply a state of insulin resistance, but it is also a chronic background, low-level tonic inflammatory state. What do we mean by that? We mean the presence of inflammatory cells in fat tissue, so macrophages for example, that secrete cytokines, that secrete adipokines. The presence of innate and adaptive T cells in uh, the metabolic tissues, by which we mean the hypothalamus, the liver, the muscle, the pancreas and the gut. And where this becomes important is that that, that inflammatory pathway also compounds the insulin resistance. What do I mean by that? Well, I think we'll skip over that, but what do I mean by that? I mean, if you look at this schematic here, insulin binds to the insulin receptor and then it signals. But inflammation through TNF-alpha or lipopolysaccharide leads to the inhibition of that insulin response substrate or insulin receptor substrate, meaning that having inflammation makes you less sensitive to insulin. So if insulin resistance is key, then surely a drug that 
addresses insulin resistance is going to work. And we had those drugs, we've had these for a long time, the thiazolidine diones. So PPAR gamma um, uh, drugs should reduce insulin resistance. They promote a favourable lipid profile and they maintain adipocyte uh, function, including improving insulin suppression of lipolysis. But we had a trial of this, and a fairly decent sized trial with 250 individuals with NASH. And although there was some improvement in inflammation, there was no improvement in fibrosis, a bit of improvement, improvement in insulin resistance, but of course, concerns around weight gain, fluid retention, um, osteoporotic fractures, means that these really haven't taken hold. But other nuclear receptors, like PPAR alpha and delta, combined have also got uh, properties that make them attractive targets. So, if you could regulate fatty acid transport, inhibit nuclear, n gluconeogenesis and inhibit inflammation, and at the same time inhibit that de novo lipogenesis, as well as have an anti-inflammatory role in the liver, then that combination sounds attractive. And indeed, there is a drug called elafibrinol, which is currently being trialled in phase 3 studies, with promising, but not groundbreaking, um, eff efficacies. So if you look at in this study then you can see I've not really highlighted it I'm sorry but essentially the response rate is around 20% compared to 10% in placebo and the target here is to reverse the NASH without worsening the fibrosis. Now let's just have a think about that. So the disease that you all see in the hospital is decompensated liver disease right? Or cancer, people who are jaundiced all right? Cirrhosis, you can have cirrhosis and be walking around feeling absolutely fine. Any one of us could have cirrhosis. So you could make the argument, and a lot of people do, that cirrhosis is the pre-disease. If the disease is everybody being bright yellow in hospital, then cirrhosis is the pre-disease. Fibrosis then is what leads to cirrhosis. So we're now some way removed from what's actually bringing people into hospital. And we think that the NASH drives the fibrosis. So 20% of people on this drug will reverse the NASH without worsening the fibrosis is a long way off making the statement that these drugs are going to save lives. But I think it's a step in the right direction. For balance, there are lots of other people who are addressing the PPAR alpha uh, axis, and if two PPARs are good, then surely three PPARs must be better, and that's exactly what this drug is targeting. The results here are very early stage. There are lots of different strategies, as I said. So there are strategies you may hear about ASK1 inhibitors coming online. These are likely to be the first to market. Again, not staggering response rates, although at least in this, with this drug, the response is in the fibrosis element, not just the inflammation. Other anti-inflammatories are also coming through, again, in phase three trials. Watch this space. There's lots of interesting mechanistic work going on. But again, what are we looking at? 20% improvement in fibrosis by one's point. What does that mean clinically? We don't really know yet. Many of you will have heard of the FXR nuclear signaling pathway. Drugs that, uh, that target this pathway have already been licensed for primary biliary cholangitis, and they're likely to get a license for uh, NASH as well. Again, response rates may be a bit better, up to 40%, but remember, these are not head-to-head -head comparisons, and these are not like-for-like -like trials. Lots of other emerging classes. The DDP4s, Felixibat, is a, um, it's, this is a sodium bile acid transporter inhibitor. Essentially, it means that you pull out all of your bile acids, gives you a bit of a diarrhea as well. But because you're not reabsorbing bile acids, that is also effective against the liver, uh, against NASH in the liver. Lots of endpoints, very broad. This is a disease for which drugs are only just emerging, but certainly nothing that's going to hit the clinics for another couple of years, at least. So what are we doing about it in my lab? Well, I run a basic science lab uh, over in the blizzard, and we, a few years ago, identified a particular protein called STAT2. STAT2 is a signalling mediator. It's a mediator of lots and lots of signalling pathways, probably best known for its role in interferon signalling. But we found that STAT2 plays a really important pro-inflammatory role in a model of inflammation. So we wondered what would happen to STAT2 in an inflamed liver. So what you can see from this slide is the expression of STAT2 in normal human liver and the brown spots are positive cells and essentially there aren't very many in the normal but in the NASH there are lots of brown spots and you can quantify that and you can see that the proportion of individuals with STAT2 positive cells is much higher in disease than control. 
Fine. If you injure the livers of wild type mice with carbon tetrachloride, dry cleaning fluid, you get cell death and scarring. It's not the same as NASH, but it is a model. And you can see that wild type, so normal mice, get lots of this sort of pale stuff around the veins. That's the injury. Whereas the STAT2 knockout, mice that don't have STAT2, are protected. You can overfeed these mice with a high fat diet. And whereas wild type mice put on a lot of weight, the STAT2 mice put on less weight and it plateaus. And that's just a fibrosis stain over there showing that the associated fibrosis is also less. You can look for genes that are involved in insulin signaling in the livers of these mice. And again, in the wild type high fat diet fed mice, a lot of these genes are turned on, whereas they're not turned on to the same extent in the STAT2 knockout. And moreover, you can knock STAT2 down in liver cells and you can injure them with fat and measure the production of cytokines and you can see that knocking down STAT2 reduces the, um, the, the fat induced injury. So in our lab we think that because STAT2 knockout mice are protected, because STAT2 mice make less cytokines and because STAT2 is upregulated in human NASH that this may be a uh, therapeutic target. And that's all well and good, and that keeps the MRC happy. But surely you must all be saying after 35 minutes, this is a disease of being overweight. Why don't we just get people to eat less and move more? And you are absolutely right. Because if we can recommend low to moderate intensity exercise, you can see this is borrowed entirely from the diabetes literature, aiming for 150 minutes a week or increasing from baseline by 60 minutes a week that we can improve ALT, improve metabolic indices and that is independent of weight loss. And if you add weight loss, you can see this from this meta-analysis, that if you lose weight, more than 7% of your starting body weight, you have an impact on histology. The NAS score is that histology score. So you can change scarring, you can change inflammation. And this has been best shown in this study from Cuba, where 300 patients with NASH, pretty high BMIs, were enrolled in a one-year li uh, lifestyle program. These guys were underfed by 750 kilocalories a day. They were made to walk for 200 minutes a week and followed up every eight weeks. Exactly the sort of thing you could roll out into your clinics tomorrow. And what you see is that if you lost, and I'm going to come over here, if you lost more than 10% of your body weight, then 80% of individuals had improvement in liver biopsy. 50% if you lost 7 to 10%, 40% between 5 and 7%. Those of you with eagle eyes, and if you can see that then you can't quite be normal, then the total number of people who achieved 10% weight loss is 16 out of the 300. So weight loss works if you can lose the weight. Everybody likes a drug, don't they? And we've got a drug that makes you lose weight. It's called GLP-1, liraglutide semaglutide. These are increasing gut hormones, induce insulin, reduce glucagon secretion, and they cause weight loss. Mechanism's not entirely clear, probably at least in part related to appetite suppression, maybe delayed gastric emptying. And there was a randomized controlled trial of liraglutide versus placebo, looking at r the resolution of NASH. And compared to what I've shown you so far, liraglutide reached the endpoint in 39% of individuals. Now, again, not staggering numbers, 52 people in the whole study, meaning 26 people received the liraglutide. But not everyone responded. And those people who did not respond to liraglutide lost just as much weight as those people who did respond. Now bariatric surgery has been shown to improve liver indices, but it's also been shown to lead to the resolution of diabetes and sustained weight loss. And the team in Lille have been doing uh, a lot of work on this in a longitudinal cohort. So in fact, Francois Patou is coming to speak to us next week at the uh, International NASH Day uh, that's taking place at the Wellcome Collection. 
you're all welcome to come if you want. Um, so what these guys have done is they've followed over 400 severely obese patients and looked to see the effect of various uh, bariatric operations on them. And what they find is that they reported 96% of individuals had very mild disease at five years. Now the problem of course is that very few of them had significant disease going into this study. They presented a sub-study of just um, 110 patients with NASH and significant fibrosis. And even there what you find is that a lot of these numbers have gone, so it's uh, the lighter the better in this bottom panel. So a lot of people got better after bariatric surgery. So, NAFLD isn't a single disease. It is a spectrum of diseases. And the first point to take away is that we need to identify those individuals, those small number of individuals who need specialist liver input from those who are simply, probably not the right word, but who are at risk of uh, metabolic um, complications alone. Trying to do that is difficult. The other issue is it's not entirely clear who we should be focusing our to come treatment efforts on. Current therapies are focused on insulin resistance, inflammation and fibrosis. Um, we are getting novel insights into biology and therapies, but I think the impact in the clinic is some way off yet. And, you know, it's nice to be able to say that at Bart's Health, at the newly formed Bart's Liver Centre, we've got a lot of work that's ongoing, both at the very molecular, translational, as well as population level, to try and crack this disease. So, thank you very much, and I'm happy to take questions now and contact about anything in the future. So, thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Will. Um, who's got the first question? Um, while you're all trying to think of questions, um, can, I, can we go back to the very beginning, whenever you were trying to get all that really informa interesting information from these enormous electronic patient records okay. across Europe? Yep. Um, how much can you trust that these patients are all drinking safe levels of alcohol? Okay. Um, you can't. You can't trust anything. But do you want me to actually put the slide up? No, no. Oh, fine. No, oh sorry. Um, so um, you can't trust anything that's in primary care records. Okay, you have to just tr believe that this is the this is now the only vehicle for doing clinical work in primary care. So we did do a subset of patients where we went back and did some text mining and looked to see what was going on. Um, but it's not so much that you. So you can't really verify that. I think the bigger question is, does it matter? So does it really matter if you've got liver injury because you are getting your calories from lager or if you're getting your calories from deep fried food or both? Now clearly there is an issue around support, so the support structures are different, the addictions are different, maybe the, the pattern of uh, liver injury may be slightly different. But what we're also finding is that the two go hand in hand. And by analogy with hepatitis C, if we had somebody who was drinking heavily and had hepatitis C, well, we'd treat the hepatitis C. And then we'd work on the alcohol. So I think there may well be multiple injuries in the liver. I mean, people are now starting to talk about baffled, both alcoholic and fatty liver disease. I think that may be a step too far in terms of, acronism, uh, uh, of acronyms. Um, acronym, it probably is, yeah. Maybe may reflect the state of mind of those who coined it, but don't quote me on that.